Hi, I'm Michael, and welcome to Beyond the Screenplay. Today, we are talking about Black Panther, the 2018 film directed by Ryan Coogler, written by Ryan Coogler and Joe Robert Cole. I'm joined by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. Hello, hello. And Alex Cayetos. Hi. Black Panther is one of my favorite movies. It's really, really good. It was on my top 10 of the last decade. And we got a lot of requests after the heartbreaking passing of Chadwick Boseman. Obviously, that happened recently. Of people wanting us to talk about Black Panther, and we'd been wanting to anyway, but also wanted to give it some space. So there's been some space now, and it's been uh, fun for me to revisit the film because I hadn't really seen it since making the video two and a half years ago talking about the the antagonist. and. It's just, yeah, I, I just love it so much. It's such a good movie and it's such an important movie. And it's one of those that like I remember going into the theater. I remember the whole experience and just the the cultural aftershocks that came are just like are one of the few things in life that like gives me hope for humanity. So like this this movie and everything encapsulated in it has there's just a lot of emotions there. And I'm I'm really, really really love it and it's a really interesting film because it's you know a superhero film it's borrowing from a lot of superhero things it's doing some really common superhero things in interesting different ways while also doing new things so it's this really fun like magical medley of all these things that came together to create this kind of uh yeah lightning in a bottle kind of feeling i think so yeah so there's so many things to talk about with it and I don't really know where to start, but I'm, I guess I'm curious for you guys, what was, what did you know about the film going into it? What were your expectations? Because I was really worried uh, because seeing the trailer, hearing that they were going to make a Black Panther movie, I, I was a little worried even after seeing Black Panther and Civil War, hmm. uh, because like I know a lot of people liked him, but you know, without knowing the comics and the history, basically I was just really worried that they were going to mess it up because there's so many examples of people trying to do inclusive things or diversity and all these things and just kind of not getting it right and dropping the ball and having yeah. it feel very phoned in or whatever. Uh, and so I was kind of in the camp of like, just don't try. Like, I don't want to deal with having to watch a movie where you failed the whole time. And now there's just like more <laughs> ammo for people to be like, see, diversity is bad. Right. So watching it <laughs> was this kind of like crazy cathartic thing where I was like, I was like, this isn't, but this isn't bad. Like every moment yeah. in the theater as it was going, I was like, wait, this isn't bad. Wait, this is good. And also just kind of looking around at the audience around me and like, checking with them like am i crazy like no one else is reacting to the fact that there's like basically only black people in this movie like everyone seems okay with this but this is breaking the rules so i don't know there's a whole we can talk about all that in, in a little bit but so that was kind of my experiences low expectations and then being so thrilled that it turned out super super well what about you guys well i think the the feeling that you're describing right now about they did a movie that was politically charged in every possible way. And already that feels like a minefield. And it's so it would be so easy to step on so many of those mines <laughs> when you set out to right. do this movie. Um, but I think one thing Black Panther does incredibly well is have a robust conversation back and forth about, particularly in this case, like, the different viewpoints of what it means for marginalized people, particularly black people in the United States, what does it mean for them to like seek, I don't know, justice or like reparations without exactly using that word. But there, that's the, that is the central conversation of the movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you have all of these resources, how do you um, undo some of the, the burden of this terrible history that has unfolded that we all agree is a terrible history. So what is the job now? Um, and so I think that leaning into that was really wise because it creates this, uh, yeah, really, really interesting conversation that doesn't shirk or shy away from some of the difficulties or sticking points of that kind of conversation. And what that itself prevents it from feeling like smarmy or performative representation. Right. It's absolutely not either one of those things. And that's, I think, why 
it's so triumphant in so many ways. And then, of course, to package that into a really awesome superhero movie, mm-hmm. you know, it it could be, you know, Ryan Coogler was famous for for uh, doing Fruitvale Station, um, which is a, a film about violence uh, against Black people in the United States. And that's just this drama, which is kind of how we are typically expect to see this material treated with like a serious, even indie drama. So then to do that in a superhero movie is just what an incredible, brilliant, brave thing to do and just a home run. Yeah, I think the thing that struck me the most about the movie was that it's a movie about race without being about race, by which I mean Hidden Figures, 12 Years a Slave, Green Book, like these right. sort of very like, look, there, there's racism. Look at it. Now, now, like watch characters change and like mm-hmm. learn and that kind of thing. And it's like. This movie is saying, first of all, it's saying more complicated things than those movies are. Exactly. But it's mm-hmm. also doing it in a more subtle way. That's not, it's not like secretive. It's not like it's, but it's not in your face either. You know, it's, it's sort of, it's right there. And it, a lot of it comes through Killmonger, which is, I think, smart writing. Um, but it's like having this conversation, like you were saying, Trisha, but without it being like, here is what this movie is about. Like there's a version of this movie where like right. Killmonger's dad was like killed by a white guy. And that's why he wants revenge and that kind of thing. And it's just like, ugh, that just sounds exhausting <laughs> compared to the way that this movie handles it, which is a mm-hmm. lot more elegantly, I think. Definitely. Well, I think part of why this film, what I was struck by when I saw it and what I was already getting a hint of in the trailers that got me excited about it. Um, was that it's it's this very positive vision it's not approaching the Mm -hmm. subject matter from just the more simple like victim meant like the victim perspective which is like those are important stories to tell like like moonlight is a beautiful film and the protagonist in moonlight is is pretty powerless for a lot of that film and is Mm -hmm. really a victim of circumstance and uh time and place and all these things and it's and it's like a it's a painful thing to watch somebody be born into circumstances that make them essentially a victim of a society or whatnot. But what this film does is essentially kind of like invert things so that we have basically the most advanced, the most technologically like wise integrated like society in the world is like hidden in Africa. And it's this um, truly African society built with like, you know, it very, very much with a love for that, you know, place mm-hmm. and that culture, um, even as it is like portrayed is in almost this, like sci-fi way. Um, yeah. Like what a cool way to talk about race and to explore these themes by actually showing like, you know, here is a culture like elevated and, and actually making mm-hmm. the African culture, the, the culture having the debate about, you know, do we help these lesser countries out there? Do we remain kind of more isolationist or do we actually open our borders and try to figure out how we can like share our, all the wealth and resources we have with the world? And I think just right there already, there, there's, also, there's so much sub, subversiveness to that. Yes. Um, right. And so right off the bat, that's what got me excited about the film was that we're, we're approaching all these themes from this already subversive place, not the typical kind of starting from the victim perspective. Right. So that, that was just... That's what was so interesting to me about the movie right up front. So kind of what you were saying, Brian, is that there is this this nuanced approach to the theme and, and to racism that it, it's it's dealing both on it's like on three different levels. There's like an interpersonal level. So it's like a family story that's mm-hmm. happening just person to person. There's that happening. And then there is the sort of, you know, racism. And what does it mean to be African-American? What does it mean to be African? What does it mean to be caught up in in that the history of the united states and all of that and then there's also this kind of like macro level like as a society as a world right what does it mean to be black what does it mean to be anything what does it mean to have power like what is the responsibility of people with power and nations that are lucky enough to have wealth what is your responsibility and it's making compelling arguments on both sides which i think is is what lends it that you know credibility and and gives it that nuance and at the same time, it's doing exactly what you're saying, Alex, where it's like it's representing so many things that are like are kind of like cultural no-nos <laughs> or yeah. like were before. Mm-hmm. You know, that's I wrote this big, long 
tweet with a stupid typo uh, after <laughs> Chadwick Boseman died. You got to forgive yourself about that, Michael. I, I, I never tweets. will. I never will. But it, it was kind of getting at this this feeling that I have and that I was sort of picking up on around this time because it was Black Panther. And then before this, Wonder Woman had come out and there was sort of stories that, that I was hearing from people where they would be watching Wonder Woman or Black Panther or whatever the movie was. Get Out was one for me. And, you know, in Wonder Woman, there's the scene where she leads the fight across no man's land. And like people, largely women, were just like bursting into tears mm -hmm. because they were just so moved by that image because that was an image that hadn't been shown to people before and hadn't mm -hmm. been shown on the biggest stage given the cultural weight of this is a big expensive movie and we're going to tell this story. And I think those moments are powerful because they reveal those kind of hidden was that we have where it's like, well, yeah, women can be in superhero movies, but there's never going to be a scene where one of them leads the charge like that. That can happen. Or the feeling that I was having watching uh, Get Out also. But uh, with Black Panther specifically, like there were mostly black people in this movie. And I was like, did, did Marvel know that they did? <laughs> like I was I was truly perplexed for like the first 30 minutes of like, is everyone OK? Like, does everyone know that this happened? Like everyone signed off on this because there aren't supposed to be this many black people in a big, ex expensive like superhero movie. And so there's like that representation happening. But there's also uh, like you were saying, Alex, like representing Africa, which yeah. in our United States culture, we usually only seen as like, this is where the poverty is and the killing and it's a bad place and yeah. right. all that stuff. Or like the white person shows up there and like everything's crazy and like it's like right. the abnormal, you know, culture. Right. Right. The moment I, I actually cracked up in the theater, I don't know if this was the intention, but I've mentioned before, you know, when like Michael Bay takes us to, you know, the Middle East or like some foreign place, <laughs> there's like you know the crazy music that happens and everything's tinted yellow because right. it's yep. like it's an other place and blah 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 and in black panther you know they reveal wakanda and it's vibrant and it's beautiful and there's all these colors and it's just like lush and great and then they cut to london and it's like monotone and drab yeah. and i was like ah <laughs> lol that's kind of funny to see <laughs> the, the western places portrayed in, in that way right yeah i do really love the um the way that they as i think you were saying alex like they lean into the african culture of it all like they yeah. you know with the yeah. costumes and like downtown wakanda or wherever is like just gorgeous it's just like well just they have like, like public transit but also these like open air markets and it just uh -huh. has this amazing blend of and, that, and, and the society itself feels like really integrated in the sense that you have everything from like their like ancient tribal customs up to like sci-fi technology right. are all kind of coexisting yeah. which yeah. is also something you don't see you know you usually see like uh like a sci-fi society or like we're like an ancient tribal society but how cool to show a culture like this kind of mythic mythical like vision of like an african country that like wasn't affected by colonialism like history didn't touch it so like what could have been, you know, in a complete alternate reality where mm -hmm. they went on their own trajectory, you know, and that's that, that is such a I haven't seen any other movie with this kind of budget do anything like that. Yeah, that's what you were saying, Michael, that I really resonate with, which is the the pure amount of just like I, I don't even know if it's faith, but just creative freedom that you feel like the, the team was given here. That's kind of what feels so remarkable about it is that none of it is dumbed down. Like none of it is. I mean, they they did put a white guy in it. And that's like, OK, but, he, but he's like a token it's, white dude, which is great. He is. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> the Tolkien white dude. There you go. Okay. Uh, the Tolkien white dude. Andy Serkis, Martin Freeman. They're so great. Also, they're so much fun. They are. Yeah. They are wonderful in it. But I, I think. Sorry, Trisha, uh, but I also think it's smart to like have like a white good guy and a white bad guy. Just like, yeah, yeah. There you go. They're here. Moving on. Like we're not <laughs> saying anything there. Just it's fine. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. But again, it's what you were saying, describing that feeling, Michael. I felt the same way too about the like the utopian society and its portrayal of women. Yep. Yes. 
yeah, I had that experience when I was seeing the the Dora Milaje and Okoye's role. And also when we get to meet all of the other amazing women. So like Shuri is fantastic and I'm in love with her. And like, she's so wonderful. What a wonderful princess <laughs> that she <laughs> right. is. Like, she's so great. And, and Lupita Nyong'o's character, Nakia, also has her, like all of her own mission and her own passions. And I looked around in the same way where I was like, do they... Is this allowed? Can we have this, right, this right. like amazing vision of of a, a truly like egalitarian society with all of this like empowerment? And it's to Marvel's credit that they went as far as they did or let Ryan Coogler um, mm-hmm. really go as far as he did with it. Yeah, it's also a nice touch that like the opening sequence is uh, T'Challa saving Nakia, but then yep. she's like, I'm on a mission. What are you doing, asshole? Like, I'm in the middle <laughs> yeah, yeah, of something. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, yeah, we see you. Nice. But yeah, there was a really nice, uh, I think, tweet that I saw by this woman sh- who I think she was Mexican and she and her dad went to see Rogue One. And on the drive home, mm-hmm. uh, her dad, who's like, you know, 80 or something like that, was just like, that that Mexican man in the movie had a, had mm-hmm. a very thick accent. And she says, yeah. And he goes, and he was he was a big character. And she says, yeah. And she goes, and I just looked at him and he just kind of was like smiling into the distance, you know, it's just like this little yeah. moment that he just like was like, wow, that that can happen. You can do this. And I think that the cool thing with Black Panther is, you know, we have this like insane wealth of like mega talented black actors, obviously. But of course, we have so many movies where it's like they're the supporting role and they're incredible. But like mm-hmm. um, or, or like maybe they're the main character, but then like everyone else is, you know, not black and that kind of thing and it's just like black panther it's like well when your tertiary actors are angela bassett forrest it's, whitaker right. sterling <laughs> k brown Denai yeah. Guerrero, daniel kaluuya it's just like good yeah. god like every it was right. just so cool to see just like everyone obviously there's so many people who aren't in this movie and like you know sequels hopefully but like but it's just so cool to see like so much talent packed into this movie Mm -hmm. a lot of people that complain about representation i feel like just don't understand what that that feeling is that moment that you're Mm. describing describing in that story because i remember that that tweet too of like Mm. the father just being like having that huh that's that's weird yeah and it's weird that that should be weird is yes. also the feeling you're having right because i was also looking around trisha as i was like wait but and also like all the characters are like women and they're all different characters and like <laughs> the, the, wait what like yeah uh that it's like it, it's weird that it's weird because also look what can happen like yes. it's weird that this is a movie that we didn't think could exist because look at how great it was and look at how much money it made and all these things. It made so much money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think $1.3 billion. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we are so close to hitting our Patreon goal of 500 patrons. As you probably know by now, once we hit 500, we'll be doing a trilogy of episodes on The Lord of the Rings and an exclusive Patreon episode on The Hobbit trilogy, which means we are going to watch those damn Hobbit movies just for <laughs> you. All of them. All of them. All We're so of the self-sacrificing. Hours. Yes. <laughs> now here's the exciting thing. If we map our Patreon progress to The Lord of the Rings trilogy, we've destroyed the ring, guys. We've done Whoa! it. There's a lot of ending. I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> and now there's 12 endings to go. <laughs> Correct. It doesn't mean our journey is over. We still have to hitch a ride with some eagles to Minas Tirith, reunite with the Fellowship in a slow motion boy romp, watch Aragorn <laughs> get crowned king and tongue kiss Liv Tyler, have him look at us and go, my friends, you bow to no one, make uh-huh. our way back to the Shire, which was thankfully not been ransacked by Saruman, hang out for a couple years, watch... Sam get married, and then finally <laughs> catch a boat with Bilbo, Gandalf, and Galadriel to the Grey Havens as Annie Lennox sings us off into the West. <sighs> wow. That's a lot to look forward yeah, to. We're not there yet. <laughs> we're not. We still have some work to do. So head to patreon.com slash beyond the screenplay. Help us make this happen once and for all. If you don't do it for us, do it for Frodo. Actually, forget that. Do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that you were scared of, Michael, with this film, it also could have gone wrong with the kind of gender equality. If if it was like, look at these powerful women that are all kind of the same and all just kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, they're just generically strong women. Because uh, th- th- that happens a lot, too, where it's like, hey, look at this like strong female lead. That's just kind of a blank slate of strongness. And what I love about these three kind of lead female characters, Okoye, Shuri and Nakia, is they all kind of represent different values. Like yeah. Okoye is like she, but they're like they're like the healthy versions 
of these like values. So it's like mm-hmm. Okoye is like the healthy version of like tradition and honor. Like she's like she wants to do the right thing, but she's also going to like serve the throne no matter what. And then you have Shuri, who is like the positive side of like technology and science. Like she's using technology to do cool, positive things. She's not, you know, making the a bomb to blow somebody up. And then Nakia is like the flip side of Killmonger, where she's kind of got the global humanitarian perspective, but it doesn't have a mindset of like let's overthrow the oppressors and kill kill everybody. You know? right. So it. I, I think they because they actually serve a purpose beyond just being like, we are the person who is the strong female lead or like we are the black people. Like, I think that's the that's the bad version of this movie is like Disney and Marvel and Hollywood being like, look how progressive right. we are. Look at our representation. But it's all kind of like for show. And mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. this film, every character actually is playing a role that is important beyond just being what they are. You know, right. so that, that right. that's why it works so well and why it doesn't feel phony. And their their actions matter. Like the the choice that Okoye makes in the middle of this movie to stay loyal to the throne, even though Killmonger has taken over, has real consequences that play out through the second half of the film and into the climax. And the same with like Shuri's, you know, love of technology and this kind of relationship that she has with her brother and all this kind of stuff. We see that she's not there to be window dressing the things that she does and like works on and develops and is passionate about those things matter. And the same thing with Nakia, we see that like her desires influence T'Challa and they, they really, you know, speak to something thematically. So I think the lesson about all of that, and we're not nearly close to anywhere close to lessons, (laughs) (laughs) but, but just in the same way that we're talking about the way to avoid this kind of, cloying or performative um, representation kind of feeling that we do get in a lot of our modern things where it's like stuff like this is stuffed in for its own sake or um, because it's optics essentially, right? Or just you want to be able to like post a picture of your cast and be like, look at all of the different, you know, people that are represented in mm-hmm. this cast. But if, if we're not doing it for that reason, but we're doing it for real story reasons where right. we're shining a light onto three dimensional people that have robust and no nuanced um, relationships with their own identities and the choices that they make are of consequence to the larger plot and themes of the movie, then you don't get that feeling at all. And so What a toast to Black Panther that in addition to being this incredible film about Blackness, it also is an incredible film about women. And I just, I didn't know it was possible. It just makes me cry. No, like, yeah. It's like, it's (laughs) doing all these things at once. And I think that's the, like, the thing that the experience that I had the first time was going in really skeptical, really worried, and then defense is breaking down. And then, oh, my God, you're doing it. And then, oh, my God, you're doing also all of it at the same time. And I just had a ton of fun watching this movie. Yeah. And and I think you're right. I think it, it requires like a commitment to fundamentally build into the story characters that matter and shape the protagonist's journey. And I feel like this is where we can kind of talk about the structure of the movie because it, yeah. it's kind of an interesting structure Mm -hmm. and it it has kind of the the marvel origin story film thing where it has a very long first act where there's just a lot of time spent you know setting up t'challa and wakanda and we get a little bit of taste of uh, killmonger but then he bounces for like 40 minutes Mm -hmm. yeah uh and it's just about t'challa and setting up the king and all that stuff and and there's the fun little detour to south korea and it, it takes a while for then the actual like plot plot i guess to, to really get going mm-hmm. and it kind of reminds me as a, as i sort of mentioned in the video of um the dark knight in that way and that it's the story that is about um black panther but it's also about wakanda it's about all these other people like there's a lot of other things happening around the protagonist and i think there's just something about the the structure of it and how how many places it goes and how much time is given to other people that makes it feel different from a lot of Marvel kind of origin story films and reminds me a little bit more of the the good parts that I like about uh, The Dark Knight or even Batman Begins sometimes where it's it's about these bigger things and it lets other characters carry some of that 
weight and do a lot of the storytelling, which I think is is also what makes it feel special and, and fresh amongst the 23 Marvel films. Yeah, there's there's a handful of Marvel films which are the first of a hero's film in the franchise, but aren't origin stories. So it's always interesting to see how right. they, right. you know, Thor is another example, like how it's like, here is a world that already exists and a dynamic that already exists, but like also things are maybe new for the protagonist, like like he is becoming king for the first time, but right. this is not like a new thing to him to to be to exist in this world, you know. So it's just cool to see how it how it handles that. I thought Captain Marvel was a really interesting one where they did like a backwards origin story mm -hmm. where it's sort of like, right. you don't realize there's going to be an origin story because that's like the origin story is a plot twist. So you just start with like, this character is here and like has powers and it's fine. Uh, so yeah, it's just, I, I really do appreciate that. Like as they are getting into this late into the MCU that they are finding fresh ways to, to sort of introduce new characters and stuff. Well, and it's smart to to have introduced T'Challa in a different film. And so, you know, we talk often about like giving your character a ghost and he mm. literally has one, but it didn't <laughs> right. it didn't have to happen in this movie. You right. didn't have to take a bunch of the time in this movie to like establish his relationship with his father. And then there's this like bombing and he like has to take up the mantle of being Black Panther. It's smart to like get some of that stuff out of the way. So we do know something about T'Challa already. At the same time, if you haven't seen Civil War, you can do fine. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of flash back to it really quickly. Um, and they do spend enough time, you know, sort of emphasizing T'Challa's burden of what he's worried about in terms of becoming a ruler. So they spend enough time with that. Um, but I agree with you, Michael. The first time I saw it, the pacing really threw me because the antagonist really doesn't have very much to do. It, he's not opposing the protagonist in the first entire half of this movie. Mm -hmm. Right. We kind of see him over there with his own like machinations of whatever that he's doing, but he's not messing with T'Challa. So T'Challa's conflict, or it's almost like there's this um, red herring villain in Claw, right? right? right. Where they're like, we're going to yeah. go get Claw. Let's Claw's the bad guy. Let's go get Claw. And then I love that handoff right in the middle where we realize it isn't Claw. Um, after all. And I love the South Korea stuff where it kind of becomes like a James Bond movie for a minute. Mm -hmm, you right. know, it's like yes. this <laughs> spy thriller. Yeah. Very literally, apparently, that was part of when they were talking to Ryan Coogler, uh, Nate Moore, one of the executives at Marvel, was sort of like, we, we kind of could see Black Panther being our James Bond. Totally. Mm -hmm. And they really lean into it for that section where it's like, you have Shuri as Q and like, these are all the gadgets. Uh -huh. And like, we're right. going to like get exactly. all these things. Yeah. And then it's like coming into the casino and it right. could literally have been from Skyfall. And mm -hmm. then there's like a fun car chase. So it, it's, I, I think that's also doing cool, you know, on like a meta level, it's letting yes, us yes, know yes. who Black Panther is because we have this clear comparison to james bond it's like okay now we're kind of in a james bond movie right but we also get to see the differences between him and james bond and i feel like how he uh interacts with uh both okoye and mm -hmm. nakia is, is very different than <laughs> yep the traditional bond i don't want to step on bond's feet in front of trisha <laughs> well, um, <laughs> well it's very it's very like healthy relationships like 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 there's right. a portrayal of like men and women as complete equals Mm -hmm. right. treating each other as equals there's no like there's not constant tension all the time it's like we can just be professional and do something together you know the shot of him and nakia coming in coming down the steps yeah. where you know they have each other's arms it, it doesn't feel like she's on his arm or he's mm. on her like they just feel mm. like they're together and coming mm -hmm. down to, i don't know for some reason just the way they perform that always like it's like oh this is such well, a healthy and in relationship. Fairness, I think Bond is probably moving in this direction, as we've seen, like yes. from even in Skyfall, there's that scene where um, you know, she turns out to be Money Penny, but you know, for a while she's an agent in the field, uh, that character. And it's a very similar scene actually, where they're they're at the casino in Skyfall and like right. they're kind of on the mission together. And I We'll never see No Time to Die, but when we do, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can expect to see Bond working with some other people in the yeah, same yeah. way mm. that we see Black Panther doing here. I'd hope. For sure. <laughs> yeah, that that whole sequence is so much fun. Um, and I, I also, I love 
they did such a good job with Okoye of like making her look oh, she's like wonderful. making a gorgeous woman look like awkward in this like yeah. really nice the dress. The wig they chose is like <laughs> right. very right. like strange on her head. It's yeah. also really funny because she is on The Walking Dead is like mm-hmm. an amazing swordsman and like she has these long dreads. So <laughs> seeing her be like this, this like little bit of hair is so uncomfortable. It's funny. <laughs> um, but then it goes into the that like single take where like all hell it's is bre- so cool. breaking loose. It's really fun. And then the car chase, like it breaks, it starts to break my sort of level of tolerance in, in terms of uh, bounciness and that kind of thing. The remote <laughs> piloting is so cool. And like, they, I'm glad so they cool. bring it back. That's that's a lot of fun. But then once it's like the slow motion car flipping and that kind of thing, I'm like, OK, it's a little far. But at the same time, I'm just having so much fun watching. I'm like, ah, it's fine. My favorite action in this movie are the like hand to hand combat scenes, especially mm-hmm. with the Koye with her like staff and yeah. her spear. So cool. the, those are just the choreography is so great. And that, yeah, that that like kind of long take vibe in the casino is so much fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I agree with you, Brian. I think the parts of this movie that like pull me back into the uh, Marvel Scrooge mode, as I played in our <laughs> Civil War podcast are like it's, it, it, you know, the car chase scene. And then also like parts of the finale do put me into that kind of glazed over mode where it's like, there's a lot of things happening on screen. I don't really know like how this shot connects to this shot or what I'm even looking at anymore. It's just happening really fast and there's a lot of it. Mm-hmm. But I, I just so prefer like I'd rather there be like a shorter car chase and more like clear action that I can follow that is really cool, like in the casino. Yeah. And those two the two hand to hand combat sequences at like the warrior waterfall place are mm-hmm. also mm-hmm. really, really mm-hmm. well choreographed. And and I think those are the ones more that I think of when I think of this movie. Like I don't immediately go to like the South Korean car chase and stuff. And so I do think you have a big Marvel superhero movie. And so you just kind of have to put some of those action sequences in it. And I think that they, I think that Ryan Coogler did a spectacular job with those like bigger ones, you know, and the battle at the end, which we can talk about that feels Mm. just like this huge half CGI thing. Um, Which is like, it starts off like I'm pretty into it at first. I'm I'm down with like their holographic shields or whatever. I'm down with like, uh, you know, Okoye and, and her like, What's the name of her battle force? The Dora Milaje. Yeah. Them fighting Killmonger is so much fun. And then it's like, why do we have to have CG rhinos? Why does mm. you have to ride them? <laughs> like, like it, it just, it goes to that next level where it's like, this was like a really actually thrilling scene. And now nothing matters anymore because like everything's bouncy. And we, and you know, even the, even the fight with um, Black Panther and Killmonger like loses some power for me near the, near the end because it's mm-hmm. so reliant on this like falling you know thousands of feet into a pit and then like the like the on and off switch of the train right it, it just it just it loses some of that more just like basic like the sim- like there's i think there's this there's a power in simplicity right. and and they, they had to even have a weird awkward scene earlier in the movie to be like hey what are those shuri like <laughs> she's like oh hey those are actually like, yeah. magnetic like you know, i'm glad you asked yeah, we can't transfer these without like magnetic systems and like they turn off and on for this reason. So I don't know. It just it feels like those things I get. There's a general Marvel mandate for like more, bigger, better. But I just who needs that? Like Zambity actually like it better because of those excess details. I don't know. Probably someone Maybe kids. <laughs> that we'll be hearing from probably, on Twitter. Probably if I was 11, I would <laughs> I would have like studied all of the technology and cared about it. So. Yeah, it's something I talked about before, which is that like I, a problem that I have with a lot of superhero movies is when like at the end, it's literally just cartoons punching each other because like once they put on their masks, it's like, well, there's no I'm not seeing any live action anything here. This is just like a fully CG scene that it's just like a bunch of running around and stuff. But that's also why, as you were saying, Trisha, like the waterfall sequences are so cool because I was like, okay, I am watching people who like learned how to do a thing. And now they are doing that thing on film for me. And like, they're also acting and there are character, like all that kind of stuff. (laughs) I don't know if I've ever seen a movie, a Michael B. Jordan movie where he has a shirt on the whole time. I'm not complaining. (laughs) I'm not complaining. (laughs) Nor should there ever be. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I think for me, those sequences work better than they do in other Marvel films, because again, I, I feel like you know you can't go into a Marvel film expecting non bouncy. It's mm-hmm. sort of like what we were talking about. With but Wes why Anderson, not? Like, why can't we do a Marvel film where that like is largely non bouncy but like delivers? This is one of the least but bu- bouncy. Yeah, which is what I appreciate about it. For, for yeah, a lot of it. well, yeah. and I think it's still. I think for me, it works because it's 
I'm still invested in like the characters and what's going to happen with them. Mm-hmm. Like I think th- even in the the car chase scene in South Korea, I think is you know, it it does lose the like, okay, well, these people aren't in jeopardy anymore, but it's still fun character moments. They're still kind of revealing mm-hmm. dynamics between uh, T'Challa and his sister and Okoye and Nakia have some funny moments. So like there's still storytelling happening, which I think is what if you're if you're going to have to rely on CG for big sequences, at least still be telling the story. And I feel like yeah. there's enough of that happening even in the finale that I'm enjoying watching the stuff happen so i don't know for me this is one where the bounciness doesn't get in completely get in the way of of it i think it's well balanced there's a yeah you have to have some of the bouncy in it and i feel like that is pretty unavoidable sorry alex but take that final climactic scene where you have cgi rhinos over there although i agree with you michael i think the coolest part about that battlefield scene is the relationship between um, Okoye and her Daniel Kaluuya, Daniel, Kaluuya. yeah, um, whatever his name his is. His name is Wakabi. Yeah, right. Anyway, but their relationship is being manifest, right? Conflict in their relationship is being manifest in that battle. So again, there's character storytelling that's happening there. But it that is the counterpoint to that fight is up on the platform where the Dora Milaje are fighting mm-hmm. and Shuri and Nakia eventually are fighting Killmonger. And all of that is like very intense character stuff that's happening. And it's also cool mm-hmm. hand-to-hand combat. Ryan Coogler is holding both of those mandates, yeah. I think, pretty well. I yeah. have no, nothing. I, I place no blame on Ryan Coogler if I, if I glaze <laughs> over in any of these scenes. I, I don't think it's his fault. It, and maybe I, this is yeah. the moment to mention, which I'm very sorry to have to tell you, that Ryan Coogler was born in 1986. So he was yeah. 32 when he made this movie. <laughs> yeah. So what a it's talent. Ex- Extremely impressive. Yeah. I'm also curious, this is a little bit of a tangent, but when hopefully, inevitably, we talk about Lord of the Rings, one of the things I'm most curious to look at is how the CG holds up Mm. in those Mm. films. Well, it's going to be remastered in the new 4K Blu-ray, apparently. Mm. Which I don't know if that that just means they're going to like re-export it in 4K or what, but... Mm. I think Peter Jackson said he's going to put more rocks in front of some of the characters. (laughs) All right. Well, stay tuned, listeners. Once we get to that, we'll we'll make sure to dive into all of that. When I complain about Marvel action scenes, it's actually not I'm not even complaining about the quality of the image. Like, like I I don't it's what takes me out of a Marvel action scene often isn't the fact that the image isn't high resolution enough or doesn't look realistic enough. Yeah, it's that the actual construction of the scene yeah. doesn't keep my interest because mm-hmm. I'm we kind know it's of, the lack of stakes, right? Yeah, well, but no, or even just editing, just even like the editing mm. or or the way that each shot flows into each other. Like like Mad Max Fury Road, I think is a remarkable feat of editing yes. because it's a completely chaotic, insane thing. But within each sequence, I feel like I am going on a journey, and moment to moment, I am like with the movie a hundred percent. I'm locked in. And I think there's a quality just in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in general for me, where moment to moment, I the movie loses me for some reason. Like, I don't feel locked in the way the shots flow into one another starts to feel like more of a mess than like an elegant like flow um, in some of these more chaotic, crazy scenes. So that that's that's really what bothers me. And I don't it's hard to pinpoint why these movies tend to like do that more than others. But like Lord of the Rings, for example. Like, even in scenes where they're using a lot of CGI, there are some scenes in Lord of the Rings that I'm not a fan of. But in general, those battle scenes, I can follow kind of a trajectory and I'm engaged with it moment to moment. So, mm. yeah. And I, I don't have uh, their names in front of me, but I was reading a little bit about the editing specifically in those waterfall fight sequences. And I was reading about how they had done like an original, they'd done like a a first cut on them. And there weren't, there weren't a lot of reaction shots from what was happening, you know, all of the viewers. And so like, even in the second one, they don't have the, you know, the entire, like all the tribes being represented or anything, but there's still, Mm -hmm. there's still plenty of people watching. And I think there's something about the formalism of that ritual combat where like think try to think of another example in a marvel movie where there is a staged 
fight and people are watching, mm. yet the outcome carries tremendous weight to the people mm -hmm. that are watching. I think it's really fascinating and a good decision. So they went back through in both of those sequences and edited in a lot of reaction shots into those fights so that we, the audience, are experiencing the ebb and flow of the action as we're seeing it on the faces of the people that are watching. And just thinking about in those in the second fight scene when T'Challa is losing and watching on the face of his mother, Angela Bassett, who's fantastic, and, and Shuri just seeing the horror and grief on their faces as they realize how badly the fight is going. I feel yeah. like that's a really, really smart decision in the editing to keep us hooked into the characters. That moment really stood out to me that the cut to um, his mm -hmm. mother and Shuri, yeah. mm -hmm. because it's such a juxtaposition to the first fight. Yes. And how we've seen Shuri throughout where she's always kind of joking and making light. Right. And so then to see her go that far really signals how intense this is. And that reminds me, Trisha, of kind of one of the more famous editing anecdotes where uh, in Fight Club, there's the scene where Edward Norton beats the crap out of Jared, Jared Leto. Leto. Thank you. Jared Leto. <laughs> and in the original cut, there was a lot more gore and showing the actual like hits landing and the actual fight. And the standards people were like, no, you can't show that. Like you have to cover this up. And so what they did is they went in and added in more reactions to it. And that ended up being more intense because mm -hmm. you're then imagining what's happening and you're seeing the horrified looks on all these people's faces as you're, as you're hearing the sounds mm -hmm. of the fighting. And that together makes that scene one of the most intense things to watch in the film. Yeah, Fincher put both cuts on like the, the DVD and I guess probably a, a, oh, on the Blu-ray. So he's like, you can watch. He's like, look how much worse the, the, the like more studio appropriate version is. And I just think that's cool. Yeah, the psychology of editing is a very fascinating thing. Yeah, for sure. So Alex, there's an exciting line in this movie that should bring out the Marvel Scrooge in you like crazy, which I did not appreciate the first time I saw the movie, which is when they bring in Ross, uh, who, you know, shouldn't be in Wakanda, because as you can tell from his accent, he's American. <laughs> <laughs> I have Martin but, uh, with an American he, he does his best. Leave him alone. <laughs> But then Shuri says, oh, great, another broken white boy for us to fix, which is your first indication that you know who is in Wakanda, Alex. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> this time watching it, I remembered. <laughs> Just imagine Alex some, being for like... For some reason, they dropped... Bucky is here. Bucky I can't your best wait. friend, Bucky Barnes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to care about so much that it motiv <laughs> motivates everything Captain America does. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is interesting with Shuri in that scene and throughout, because as I was saying earlier, she, you know, she has this technology, but I'm not going to pretend like she has an arc in this movie because I, I don't really think she does per se. Right. Mm. There's not really space for her to have an arc in this sure. movie. Yeah, she's cute. But she she has a lot to say and she brings such life. She's more than comic relief. Her quips tend to like recontextualize the way that we are thinking about something in a scene. Um, and that's kind of the effect they have on T'Challa also, where she kind of reframes something that either his mother has said to him or Nakia has said to him. And then Shuri will kind of make a half joking comment about it, but it, it adds another layer of thought to whatever is, is going into it. And it's a really cool... I mean, this is kind of my lesson, so I don't want to like get into it too much, but it's just when we think about tertiary characters, I think we tend to give them like one personality trait and they they don't have to be one dimensional, even if they don't have an arc. And Shuri mm -hmm. is a really great example of that. She is not one dimensional. And I love I love the sequence where he's like I, when we first meet her, it's a great introduction for her character where he. They, you know, he lands and he's like, oh, my little sister is here to see me on my you know, day that I'm going to become king. And she's like, uh, absolutely not. I'm here to get that technology from you so I can fix it. Um, she has that a bit on the nose moment where she gives him a little lesson on just because something is working doesn't mean it can't be better. Like, thank you, Sherry. We see you. <laughs> but then the moment where she walks away and flips him off is okay. such a great moment because yeah. It, it brings her down in age, right? She ha carries herself with this poise and maturity, but it's such an immature thing to do. And then she gets scolded and like it creates this wonderful family dynamic that's really sharply observed 
and again, creates dimensionality in just a smart, efficient way. I also think it helps to, um, to, because we are in this like fantasy world of Wakanda, it helps one to have a character like Shuri, who is the sort of, uh, or have Ross come in as like the fish out of water kind of thing where it's like, there are what we would call like normal people here who are just like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. And then obviously to have Killmonger as the villain who is just like a regular oh, dude, yeah. you know, like there's a version of this movie where the villain is like, is, is Winston Duke's character, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or, or something like that where it's, or, or it's like they're from this other part of Wakanda where like everything is this way or whatever. And it's like, no, we are, we are seeing what we think of as regular people, both, from out of Wakanda, but also people like Shuri in Wakanda, who it's like, no, we can flick each other off and like joke about how you froze and that kind of thing. And it helps keep the movie feel grounded and not feel like we're living in like crazy fantasy world. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the things they they talked about also in, in an interview was, you know, having them. I mean, yeah, so Killmonger is American, right? So he comes mm-hmm. from our world literally is from the United States and Siri is cued into American culture. Also like the sneakers that she makes for yeah. T'Challa mm-hmm. is also kind of like a reference to back to the future. And so it's, it's signaling that like Wakanda takes place in our world and there are people there that still have access to our culture. So it's right. It's creating that familiarity like you're talking about. So we can kind of frame our understanding a little bit more of, of where we are and how it operates. Speaking of Shuri and sneakers, the white dress and sneakers that she wears in like her first big scene, I'm just, like the costume in this movie is so damn good. It's like every amazing. costume is fantastic. Should we talk about production design? I think production yeah. design we should talk about. Yes, can we please? Well, I know that they sewed about 700 costumes mm, for this wow. movie and the attention to detail on every part, like every single thing that's on screen because you're you're creating the entire culture of a nation Mm -hmm. that does not exist. So everything from the architecture down to the music in theory, right? Like that we might hear like ambient sound to like every single costume item, jewelry item that people might wear or not wear. And you're, you know, there are these five distinct cultures and tribes within this Mm -hmm. like country and the amount of, like creativity and vision, but also grounded research. There is a reason that Hannah Beachler won an Oscar for the production design in this mm-hmm. film. It is incredible. I love uh, when they go to like the mountain tribe in, in the second half of the movie. So cool. The like cool like <laughs> minimalism of it. Like it's it's like these you know these like earthy materials, but done in this like modern minimalist way, and that's part of that like the aesthetic of this film that is so interesting is it, it there's this awesome combination of like high tech and modern with like earthy tribal, like ancient. Uh, and, and I just, I think it's such a cool look. I, that, that's one of my favorite things about the film was just the production design of Wakanda in general. And just, and also like Shuri's lab is like so cool. Mm-hmm. Cause it's got like cool. kind awesome. of this, this like kind of street art on the walls, but also has the totally just like, high tech James Bond vibe. Uh, there's there's such a fusion uh aesthetically in all these different set pieces that um I haven't seen anywhere else with in this kind of budget range. And I think what's impressive to me is that it it feels like everything you guys are saying and and it it's somehow even in in representing these kind of cultural things not doing that performative thing. Yes, it's, like, yes, it's not yes. just taking like pieces of African culture and being like, look, Americans, it's African culture. It's an other thing. Mm-hmm. Like so it's it also feels integrated and like respectful and actually honoring what it is. Yeah. And like but yeah, fusing it with cool new visuals, but not just like translating it for other people. Like there's just there's something in the spirit of how they portrayed Wakanda that is feels like magic that somehow it's it's part of that like tightrope walk that i feel like somehow they they walked with this of making it accessible to everybody and really cool while also not like dumbing it down or yeah being performative like actually like being honest with the representation and just i i think that's a a thing that in general is very, very hard for people and it's a cultural thing that we're dealing with now is like how do you hold 
the past, hold tradition, hold culture, but also we're in this new kind of global culture and things are changing and things are integrating and, and all this stuff. I feel like this is like a, a nice like handhold to have or, or of like this is they did it well mm. here. Well, and I feel like there's also there is a kind of political statement being made in the sense that there's this kind of background noise of what does it mean for like globalism and, and cultures to be integrating? Are we going to lose kind of like Western civilization? And I think almost what this film is stating is like, it doesn't matter, like, you know, you can be an evolved society uh, coming from different roots and have, and have and it, can, it can be different. Like, you, like Wakanda is like this high tech evolved society that comes from like a different cultural like origin like seed and it and it's really cool and and awesome and i think i i like that this film uh almost like puts lie to the idea that there's like this european american like version of like civilization that's the only kind that could ever exist and there's no yeah. other shade of like a high tech you know uh civilized world and this is like this completely like on its own trajectory uh african version of that and it's awesome and so like i want to live in wakanda i want to see <laughs> i want to I wanna see different versions of the 21st century that aren't just what we're stuck with now because it doesn't seem to be working very well um so <laughs> so i'm open to new ideas <laughs> yeah so i i I, that's that's one thing I that's one of my lessons from this movie is just it's a different kind of like science fiction design fiction that this film is doing is like, yeah, you know, imagining what a high tech 21st century society looks like from a different origin place, you know? Yeah. So it's it, 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 and on top of that, the other subversive thing this movie does is all the like CIA stuff, which is great. Like, mm. like it's throughout, they keep sprinkling in these things about like. Killmonger was trained to do this thing where you like yeah. overthrow a government. And like, I just, I just love how much Ryan Cooler got like kind of sprinkled in throughout all these, all these comments he's making about just the history that we're grappling with. So For sure. yeah, movie is amazing in that it, it, <laughs> it does a lot at once and it sometimes feels a little bit messy because it is doing so much at once, but I'm impressed by the amount that it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think it ultimately works because it it does have a strong core theme that is able to come back to and comment on and and again it's working on these levels of like not just representing like certain characters or certain groups of people but like what humanity could be. Also yes. like that's I think what you're saying is like look at this vision of what humanity could be like aspirational positive things. Yeah. And yeah, just coming back to this this idea of what do you do what's your responsibility if you have power and you know I, I feel like we haven't really talked about Killmonger and I, I think it's kind of already been said a lot but I think the interesting thing in his construction is like we we're saying earlier that he and Nakia kind of have the same philosophy that Wakanda should do more like if you have power you should be helping people and it's just how extreme you are <laughs> that can make you the villain and I think mm -hmm. that's just a really it's just a smart construction for um, an antagonist because the antagonist is ultimately there to teach the protagonist the lesson. And so it's he's he's an extreme version and it's so extreme that you don't want to end up where he is, but he's extreme enough to knock T'Challa loose from his kind of principles that were holding him back from being what he should be, which is a little bit more toward the other side. Right. And it's smart when you have this design of characters who all have their own value system and stuff that Killmonger feels like adjacent to some of them. Like the fact that he has like right. believes the same thing as Nakia, but in just a more extreme way. And then Okoye is like, well, I guess I have to protect the throne because that's how I am. And then Daniel Kaluuya's character goes so far as to be like, actually, I kind of think he's right. I'm going to side with him. And I think that's really smart because one, it gives him it gives Killmonger an army, but two, it keeps it from just being like, well, we all clearly have to kill this bad guy, right? Like, because otherwise, right, like, right. he doesn't take the throne, just thousands of Wakandans just murder him. And just that's the end of the movie. You know? um, right. But uh, but yeah, to, to actually make it so that, like, he is able to sort of charm some of them or because of the laws of Wakanda, they have to kind of side with him and that kind of thing. It, it just, like, allows for a lot of diamondism to to the conversation around Killmonger. And he's T'Challa's cousin, which I mm. think is also right. really incredible character design because the minute that T'Challa 
sees, you know, his his father's ring or, you know, basically an exact duplicate of his father's ring and realizes that whoever this person is, he is a Wakandan, but B, related to me from the royal line in some way. You know, at that point, we don't even see them start to interact. But T'Challa starts to think about who Killmonger is. Mm -hmm. He like that's long before they meet. And I mean, they kind of, you know, other than that, he like sees him escape with Claw. But but they don't confront each other. They have not met. They haven't they've spoken to each other. But when he says he realizes this is a relative of mine and he hears the story of what happened from Zuri, he starts the journey of trying to understand Killmonger's point of view. Like mm-hmm. that is one of the things that makes T'Challa such an interesting hero is his immediate compassion. And we see it. It's really wisely set up in that first fight that he has um, with Winston Duke, with it, with M'Baku, where right. he could kill him and he doesn't. Mm-hmm. He is a leader that is already, we've seen that his primary trait or one of his primary traits is compassion and mercy. And so when he learns that this boy was left behind by his own people and his own culture in poverty in the United States, that's the minute that he starts to think about mercy and compassion for this young boy that he can see is, you know, the the wounded person inside of, of Killmonger. And it's really, be- I mean, Chadwick Boseman's performance is so yeah. beautiful mm-hmm. throughout this movie. It's great character work. And that it's left that he was left behind by his father too. Yeah. Like I think that's part of T'Challa's arc. Also, obviously, is sort of he wants to be as good of a king as his father. And kind of by the end, he sees that his father wasn't perfect and made not compassionate choices, and sort of sees the error in holding too hard to mm-hmm. self preservationist principles and like look at what happened and and I think there is something really interesting about how like T'Challa and Killmonger like could have been each other like they're kind of just Mm -hmm. where they happened to be born right determined who they grew up to be and I think that's a really powerful message also yeah that Black Panther gets that and is willing to you know like his dad says in, in the first yeah, you know, ancestral plane conversation. It's hard for a good man to be king. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's what this is getting at. It's like, if you care, that means you have to make hard decisions. And it's a lot easier if you don't care. But yeah, Black Panther is someone who cares, which I think is really cool. Just the last thing I want to say about Killmonger is that it's kind of through him that the film is able to talk about, you know, what it means to be African American and kind of engage with a lot of issues that are present there uh in a kind of indirect way but but still keeping them present you know he grows up with a father who was murdered and wasn't around but for these kind of like non-normal circumstances but like he's just like every kid growing up in oakland the line where he says everybody dies around here is awful where Mm -hmm. his you know he his father has died and he's like oh you're not gonna cry for me and, you know, this kid trying to be tough is like, no, because everybody dies around here. Mm-hmm. It's it's just good, smart shorthand for the kinds of oppression that we are familiar with in the way that you were talking about, Alex. Like, we've seen all the stories about all the violence and oppression. Um, so we don't need to, this movie doesn't dwell on them a lot, but it's in there enough in the character of Killmonger that we see it. Right. You know, right after that scene, he's awful and burning everything and treating everybody terribly. So like, he's clearly the bad guy but i feel like that scene does so much work to just like make you get it and get the consequences of why t'challa shouldn't be like his father why he shouldn't make those same choices uh and yeah i think that the the line that then that kind of sets up that gets me at the end is when he says so after black panther stabbed him and he's talking about wakanda and my dad always said he was going to take me here Mm -hmm. and kind of like laughing at the idea of like you know imagine that Mm -hmm. a kid growing up in oakland believing in fairy tales Mm -hmm. and i think that's sad for killmonger but i think that's in this kind of bigger more macro level i think it's really cool that kids growing up in oakland have that fairy tale now like they have Mm -hmm. black panther Mm -hmm. and i think that just like all of that together is like yeah always gets me it's just so good so yeah also, the real life fairy tale of Ryan Coogler making Black Panther. Hell right. yes. Yeah. Yes. Like 
growing up in Oakland. Literally. Mm-hmm. Making, yeah, it's the whole movie. It's pretty amazing. Top to bottom, meta, and in the film. A little bouncy, but otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. It does so much amazing stuff. I forgive the bounciness. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Why don't we go around and say what lessons we're going to take from Black Panther? Brian, do you want to start us off? Sure. Mine's actually about a moment that I think about a lot when I'm thinking about structure, which is um, when T'Challa goes over the edge of the waterfall and Killmonger takes Mm. the throne. And I think, first of all, it struck me the first time I saw the movie where I was like, well, that's a crisis for you where like we literally killed the hero, (laughs) like as far as ostensibly speaking. And I think that I really like when a movie, especially that late uh, around the end of the second act, I just don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know where it's going, as I think that a lot of movies have, especially superhero movies, especially action movies, they have the problem of you're around the end of the second act. There's still 40 minutes to go and you know what's going to happen. It's just about executing now. It's just about, okay, we got to get here and then we got to fight the thing. There's going to be like a plot twist and like someone, whatever, but like we basically know everything that's going to happen. And I love that at that point in the movie, there, you just have no idea what's coming next. Like, how are they going to get from here to some sort of satisfying, hopefully happy ending? Even if you're like, well, look, T'Challa's alive. He's going to come back. They're going to take down Killmonger. Even if you know the broad strokes, like you, you believe that that is what's going to happen. It's you still don't know how they're going to connect all the dots. You have no idea like how the characters are going to get from point A to point B, what machinations are going to happen in order to get to the finale that you're looking for. And uh, and I just think that's really cool structure design. Anytime I just feel like I we're this late in the movie and I don't really know where we're going from here. Right. It is interesting that the the film goes all the way there where it is the worst possible thing. Like mm-hmm. Killmonger is now the king of Wakanda. Like the I remember being struck by how far they'd gone and that, that actually happened and also being kind of confused structurally. Cause I was like, wait, is this <laughs> midpoint what? or is this crisis? But, wait, but what? So yeah, <laughs> uh, I think anytime a movie can confuse me with structure stuff, I'm excited also. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alex, what about you? My friend sent me an article recently that it came, it came to mind when I was watching this film and it was um, the article was making this interesting case that we often say, right now when talking about like the culture wars in America or just anywhere like it, that we're, we're falling prey to tribalism. Like, you know, we're being, we have this tribalism problem of like my political tribe or your political tribe. And this author was saying, actually, like you're kind of, it's almost like a diss to tribes, you know, like, like actual indigenous tribes, like, because they actually have like mm-hmm. kind of a healthy, like there's a very healthy <laughs> version of like being a tribe. And actually what we have is like factionalism, you know, we, we Here's my faction mm. versus your faction. But we actually could use more of the values from like indigenous tribal culture in our society to kind of like mm. stitch us back together. Like mm-hmm. there's there's ideas of like it, when you're in a tribe, you know, in like a healthy tribal culture, you have a sense of purpose and belonging beyond your like economic value. You know, you yeah, you you have rights of initiation where like you are kind of guided into adulthood in this like healthy way to make sure you kind of like just understand your responsibilities as a man or a woman. And you know, there, there's these things that are kind of missing from modern life that are leading to a lot of the like existential, like despair and depression and like just kind of like aloneness that is so prevalent in our society. And like, that's actually, we need some of those things. And I think what is so cool about Black Panther is that you usually think of, you know, aspects of like indigenous tribal culture as kind of just in the past or like from a different time that couldn't ever possibly be reintegrated into like a really modern world. But the design fiction of Wakanda is actually just that it, it's there. They have these like really tribal ceremonies and there's even kind of like, it's basically like an ayahuasca trip or something when they, when they <laughs> uh-huh. drink, when they drink from like the purple <laughs> flower and like mm-hmm. go to the other, you know, the other realm or whatever, they have those and they're not at all out of place in an otherwise like high tech modern yeah. like public transit city <laughs> and and the city itself even has like this kind of like greenery and like lushness and nature integration um mm-hmm. in its visuals so i just think i think uh, i love that idea of like design fiction doesn't just have to be as i said before for like minority report where you're imagining like this world projected into the future with like you know scary technology it can also be used to imagine what if we 
integrated things from our past into the present in a way that wasn't at odds, but actually like brought back what we're missing, you know, that and, and what kind of seems like a healthier society and just more balanced uh, in that world of Wakanda. So that's my big, long uh, lesson. <laughs> <laughs> be good if we could all see our the whole world as one big tribe. We're yes, all part it would. Of the as, same yeah, tribe. As, as he says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Trisha, what about you? So I talked a little bit about Shuri and I won't spend too much time on just talking about the nuance of the way that characters speak. Like she has a very distinctive voice in this movie. And I think that that's really important for tertiary characters. I also, though, want to talk a little bit more about Killmonger for two reasons. One, the character voice that is created is such an outsider's voice just like the not not just Michael B. Jordan's delivery, which is incredible of of all the dialogue here, but just the the sort of like you get the sense that Killmonger himself is deliberately speaking with a, a completely different outsider voice and and making light using Americanisms and like sort of American slang to make light of and like assert his dominance. So like mm, thinking about mm-hmm. that scene in the throne room where he says, hi, auntie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. To Angela Bassett, which is amazing. Such a great moment. <laughs> it's such a fantastic moment, but it is an assertion of dominance in that moment, right? Where he is, this is the queen of Wakanda. <laughs> and <laughs> right. that's how he greets her, right? Mm-hmm. It He's putting down their like, the more traditional ways that they have of, showing respect and treating each other and whatever it to make a play of like a power play in the room. And he does that every time that he's on screen and like speaking to people where he tells the people to like burn all the heart shaped herbs. I wish I had the exact line in front of me, but he's like, yeah, I'm going to need you to burn all that (laughs) or something like it's something like that. But again, it's, this is the most sacred thing in the world to them and he's using this American slang almost to... Like devaluing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's the right. word I'm looking for, to devalue all of it. So it's just really, really good dialogue writing. And, and of course, like, yeah, like I said, impeccable delivery on Michael B. Jordan's performance. And to just kind of underscore that, it's, you know, it's using... He's wearing his background where right. he grew up like he keeps that with him but it's also not just performative of like let's make him speak like he's from oakland just so he right. see, feels authentic right it's like you're saying it's doing multiple things at once and that's why i think it it works so well to have him be that authentic and like not shy away from that place that he comes from right and it also it makes him charming but it also makes him more evil which i think you need the like evil counterpoint to the very compassionate side that we see like i think he is a an empathetic antagonist i think the way that he carries himself and speaks makes him like a little bit more dangerous right mm-hmm. away also he kills his girlfriend right. which right <laughs> i could talk about that moment for a while but it's i think it's such an important moment for making us really understand who the villain is here. Like, we see all of the scars on his body of people he's killed, but we don't see him kill those, like, you know, 100 people or whatever. Right. We need to see him kill, and then he kills Claw, but we don't care about Claw. Claw's a bad guy. We need to see him be the bad guy before he gets to Wakanda. And the fact that he shoots his girlfriend in cold blood is a really, really smart choice that is chilling like Mm. and you just there's no doubt anymore after that as to how dangerous exactly he is right yeah shows that he's dangerous and yet he's out eviling claw who was already (laughs) kind of like his name is claw first of all and then (laughs) yeah it's it's also fun to see andy circus be him you know be not a cg character every once in a while (laughs) for sure his performance is fun in this and he kind of goes a little crazy i think maybe that's also why i think of the dark knight occasionally because he kind of dips into Joker territory at some points where he's just like, I'm going to sing what is love and I'm going to be crazy and zany. <laughs> uh, but it, I think it ultimately works because then at that moment that you're talking about, it's like it's such a clear power shift of like whatever this guy was capable of, this man just put him down. And so he's the real threat here. Right. Yeah. 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 Also, Michael B. Jordan. It's also just like, yeah. you know, Best. he can be a good guy. Like, it was so much fun following him on Instagram because he and Lupita just have so much fun together. And they're just, uh, they look like fun people to hang out with. Anyway, 
<laughs> Call us. We'd love to hang <laughs> yeah, out with you yeah. guys. <laughs> DM Michael for more info. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, f- I feel like there are lots of different lessons to take away from this movie. And I think for me, it reminds me that it's okay to be optimistic sometimes. Like, I think I'm a very cynical person. And I think a lot of the times, as we've been saying, when we're dealing with really heavy, important issues, you know, we get stuck in like, there's a way to deal with them. There's a way to present them. They have to be like this and gritty and no one smiles and like all these things that we've talked about a bunch of times. And I think those are useful and have their place. Uh, So I'm not saying we shouldn't have those. But I think it's also cool to see an example of like a, a celebratory movie, like a movie that is fun, but also teaches a lesson, deals with all these things and is willing to like risk painting like a vision of the future that is good. And I think Mm -hmm. that's, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not, we don't get that a lot. I feel like there's, we have a lot of, (laughs) if if you want it to be believable, you got to have a little bit of like cynicism and like, you know, and and there's enough of that in this movie, I think for you to, to be able to take it seriously, but it's not afraid of being optimistic. And I think, you know, especially seeing uh, like kids watch the movie and then seeing, mm-hmm. as I've talked about before, when I in Infinity War, when Black Panther showed up for the first time, all the kids next to me, like all did the Wakanda mm-hmm. salute. And I was like, oh, my God, like the, these are kids that have not been cynicized by society like mm-hmm. me. <laughs> and they're excited because they're not because they're seeing this cool black person, but because they're seeing a person. And like, that's cool. And so I think letting yourself be optimistic enough to tell stories about change that paint a picture of what life could be or should be, I think is useful. And we don't have enough of that, I think, in the world right now. Absolutely. Black Panther manages to be a real role model. Like he's Mm -hmm. complex. He goes on a journey. He's flawed, but he's still aspirational. There's still a lot of like really beautiful lessons to learn from that character. And I think that's part of the reason I, it just, it's so, yeah. sa- it's so sad. It's heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 But what an amazing gift that was left for us and the world. Yes. And yeah, I'm so glad that we, that we have it. Yeah. I agree. Why don't we go around and say what we've been watching recently? Brian. Uh, appropriately, I watched The Five Bloods. Um, nice. The, mm-hmm. Yeah. The Spike Lee. 2020 Netflix movie, um, which was will be, I think, Chadwick Boseman's second to last uh, movie. And he's fantastic in it, but he is not a he's sort of the heart of the movie because it's about these five Vietnam vets who 40 years later, four of them who have survived, Chadwick did not, are going back to find his remains in the jungle for reasons that become clear as you see the movie. Spike does an interesting thing where he has these 70 year old men play themselves in the flashbacks. So like Chadwick is their leader, but it's like a bunch of 70 year olds like taking orders from this like 35 year old dude. Um, but still like just the performances are great. And it, it almost it's almost like you couldn't cast younger people because you need to see them interact with with this mm-hmm. person who is just like I said, the spirit of the movie and the person who keeps their sort of morals in check and their ideals and everything. And uh, and yeah, it's a really fun fun's not the right word, but like it's a very engaging movie that goes a lot of places and it takes a lot of really interesting twists and turns. Chadwick is lovely in it. Again, he's he's probably only on screen for about 20 to 25 minutes, but he just he really steals his scenes. And Delroy Lindo is unbelievably good. Like, I don't know what the Oscars are going to be, but he needs one uh, whenever whenever this movie is eligible for some sort of awards. He needs to win all of them. He's unbelievable in this movie. And Spike does some of his Spike things, which I don't mind. I'm like his sort of like movies are propaganda thing, which I'm like, look, all art is propaganda for whatever the sure. hell you believe. So go for it. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I recommend it. It was, uh, it was a good time. Nice. Right. Very cool. Trisha, what about you? I watched Memories of Murder from 2003, which is Bong Joon-ho's second film. Mm -hmm. And it is so good. (laughs) Like, I've seen, I I feel like the last few movies I've recommended on this podcast 
nothing wrong with them. They're fine. Like, and they're interesting, all of them in their own way. Uh, and I, I can't remember what the last half a dozen were exactly. So maybe there's a really, really good one in the bunch. But man, I think this is one of the best movies I've watched recently. Like Bong Joon-ho is incredible, but it's also like this movie just checks a lot of my boxes because it's a detective crime thriller with the like weird comedy flavor that you kind of want and hope for from Bong Joon-ho. So it's so it stars uh, Song Kang-ho, who is plays the dad in Parasite. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously he's a lot younger, but it is based. The story is based on a true like murder, like case of serial murder in rural South Korea Hmm. that at the time was unsolved and it's about the investigation and it's just like a, it's basically their version of like a Zodiac where the details of the crimes are nuts and it almost feels like the murderer is toying with them, but it like really happened. And it's this like rural detective, like police force that has never had to deal with anything remotely like this. They're so unequipped to handle it. And they're kind of bungling and there's a lot of weird comedy in it. But at the end of the day, it's like a really taut horror thing with some of the which I really liked thriller. It's thriller, which I really liked. There's not a lot of gore in it, Um, (laughs) but but there are some really scary images in it um, because the murderers, the murderer is like taunting them almost. And they're 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 like, you know, the pressure is increasing and they're really struggling to find a way to catch whoever this person is. So it's awesome. Uh, I recommend going into it without looking up the real cases, like watch the movie, then look up the real cases. Uh, It's just a fantastic ride. And and early Bong Joon-ho, if you love Parasite and and some of his other more recent films, you'll really like this, I promise. It's great. I'm pretty sold. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds right up my alley also. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely been wanting to go back and check out his his pre-Snowpiercer stuff because I was not a fan of Snowpiercer, Mm -hmm. but after Parasite, I'm like, all right, (laughs) <laughs> Memories of murder. It'll get it. It's nice. great. Yeah. Awesome. We should watch Zodiac also. You probably Let's... love Zodiac, right, Trisha? You've definitely yes. watched it. And you... I've definitely watched it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> I have certainly not watched it, but it's on my list. I, w- I would love to watch it. There are some intense moments that I'll makes me think of you in not a good way. But yeah, you'll be <laughs> it's worth it. We'll have a conversation about it. It's Zodiac not seven. Right. It's not Yeah. I've I have seen seven. Okay. Oh, yeah, you'll be so fine. You're fine. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. fine. Okay, great. Alex, what about you? Uh, so in the spirit of October, uh, we rented uh, The Invisible Man, Elizabeth Moss, uh, 2020 version. Uh, it's a classic kind of Blumhouse like movie, which is, you know, that kind of like lower budget, mid budget movie with like one big star. And she really does carry the whole thing. You know, Elizabeth Moss is amazing. and Which she can easily do. Right. If you need someone to do that. It's basically <laughs> just all about her and her performance, which is just, you know, this like deteriorating, like everybody thinks you're crazy because of course you're being haunted by an invisible man. If you want to cast somebody to be a woman who like greatly suffers over the course of a film, but then kind of like... <laughs> but is still a badass. Overcomes mm-hmm. and is a badass. Like that's like her thing now, <laughs> if you've seen The Handmaid's <laughs> Tale. <laughs> so yeah, ultimately it was very satisfying. It has a nice uh, nice midpoint uh, moment, nice midpoint twist uh, for Michael there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a good it's a good at home uh thriller october rental if you're in the mood for that right now nice very nice michael so i took a week off as of the recording of this where i just went and kind of like turned my brain off and binged a few things one of the things that i binged was uh the video game star wars squadrons Mm -hmm. uh which just came out and it's a really cool star wars story and this is like the second or third time now that this has happened where the movies that we're getting from Star Wars are imperfect. I will use that word. <laughs> uh, so polite. But uh, like the video games seem to have this kind of freedom to explore interesting periods of time in the Star Wars mm-hmm. canon and timeline and deal with pretty interesting like little like hyper focused topics. And so, you know, the game is a, a simulator game. Uh, like a flight simulator game where you're in the cockpit of an X-Wing or an A-Wing or a TIE fighter and you're, you know, just you're doing dogfights and like all this stuff. So it could have just been that, which, you know, the original X-Wing versus TIE fighter was and all that harkens back to that that original game series. 
but there's actually a pretty cool story happening that they've crafted with like a nice little arc about the struggle post Endor, post Return of the Jedi. Mm. Like, what does it mean to be building this new republic? Cool. What is the kind of the the death throes of the Empire? Like, what are they doing? And it's all told through these two squadrons, one an Empire squadron, one a New Republic squadron, and you're jumping back and forth narratively. And so you're playing both sides and kind of seeing both sides of the story. And it was just, it's it's a simple, nice, contained uh, story that I think they they orchestrated very nicely and they they didn't have to do as good a job as they did. And it was actually just a very nice, lovely little piece that I can put in like the Star Wars timeline that doesn't make me upset in any way. It's like, <laughs> oh, this is really what, interesting. It's like, like, that sounds great because like I wanted to know what the New Republic was like or know anything about the New Republic before they blew it all up <laughs> all at once. So right. I would love to experience that. And they talk about they talk about that place that they kind of blow up and they, they're sort of like <laughs> thematic like wrestling of like, is the new Republic just going to become the empire? Like there's, mm. there's some kind of heady themes happening also of like the weight of power. Mm. Imagine that. Uh, and you get to fly in an A-wing and blow up tight. Like it's just Very so cool. much. Yeah. yeah. So I highly great. recommend Star Wars Quadrants. Well, this has been our conversation about Black Panther. Beyond the Screenplay is produced by Vince Major. Our editor is Eric Schneider. I've been joined today by the Lessons from the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand, Brian Bittner, and Alex Cayeros. I am Michael Tucker. You can find all of our Twitter handles in the show notes. Feel free to reach out, say hi, tell us how much you love Black Panther. Thank you to the patrons who support this show. There is a fun patron-exclusive episode coming coming this month where we're going to be watching The Thing, yeah, which I have never seen before. <gasps> and oh, so I am... Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, so <laughs> that'll be releasing to patrons by the end of the month. Uh, so thank you to all of them for supporting the show, making it possible. Thank you for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>